Okay, let's start, uh, folks. Um, my name is Alexander Kramer. I'm professor of public health at Bielefeld University at the School of Public Health. And uh, I welcome you very much to this online conference on refugee health. Uh, the title is listed here. It's International Dialogues, Health Policy Recommendations Based on Scientific Evidence. And I'm very happy and uh, proud that we have uh, 170 participants from uh, very many countries all over the world from all uh, continents. This is really great. And I also welcome and uh, thank a lot uh, our distinguished speakers that followed our invitation. Uh, thanks a lot. I know many of them uh, since uh, several years and we have been working together on various aspects on refugee health. Uh, so uh, thanks a lot uh, for participating and providing your uh, important uh, views. Um, as you know from the program, we will have uh, three sessions after some little introductory remarks that I will make at the beginning. Uh, each of these uh, two sessions at the beginning, uh, we will have uh, four talks of uh, the distinguished speakers that provide information on refugee health of their home country, or will also talk about uh, certain aspects like, for example, the role of universities in refugee health research and uh, the relation uh, between, for example, peace activities, refugee health and public health activities, and also um, from uh, Charles Aguiemang from Amsterdam, we will have a presentation with respect to the role of COVID-19 uh, in the refugee health uh, activity. And after this presentation, we will then have a moderated discussion and uh, you can, the participants all over the world, you can uh, chat uh, with the speakers and with us. So I urge you also to use this uh, facility and uh, ask your questions and provide your comments to the speakers. Uh, these uh, comments and questions will be compiled uh, by Miriam uh, <coughs> uh, here and also by uh, Kerstin uh, Schmidt and then uh, we will have a moderated discussion about these topics. So I really urge you to use this uh, utility and um, please do so. And then we will also have our, after the sessions, session one and session two, uh, we will have a break. And in the break, uh, there's the opportunity for you, for those who would like to take this opportunity to have breakout sessions where you can also uh, talk individually to uh, the speakers and uh, provide further questions and, and comments. At the end, we will have a, a discussion section, a summarizing discussion, which is um, provided by Kevan Bozogmer uh, from Bielefeld University School of Public Health and Dr. Santos Höfener from Robert Koch Institute our Centers for Disease Control in Berlin, who are also experts in the field of refugee health and refugee health research. They will synthesize uh, the different um, discussions and also the presentations and provide their own view. And then uh, at the end, you will again have the chance also to ask further questions. So welcome again. And uh, let me now start with my uh, introductory remarks. Actually, I uh, cannot go. Ah, now it works. Thank you. Okay, great. In my introductory remarks, I would like to open the horizon and mark the context of refugee migration in the globalized world. World humanity and our field of public health are, as you know, currently struck by and concerned with three major crises. The so-called refugee crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic and climate change. These crises are of course not independent, but linked to each other. 
they also show some common features, some of which are listed here. One such feature is the global dimension of each crisis. Another feature is the complexity of each of these crises and the complex interaction and relation between them. In spite of the global dimension, a sub substantial regional and local differences of the challenges of course exist uh, between different countries. Above all, and this represents a particular challenge and also chance for our field of public health, the health dimension is a dominant feature for all why attempts for mitigation and control of these crises will not only affect the health of individuals and populations, but can be motivated by the common important health feature. Governance is another challenge. In this regard, we lately face several failures and weaknesses. For example, the failure of the, United, the European Union to manage refugee migration by a just distribution of refugees to receiving countries of the European Union. Another weakness of governance is the current weakness of the United Nations and the WHO, uh, for example, after withdrawal of the United States. On the contrary, we observe increasing nationalism and competition in a multilateral world instead of global governance. However, problems are characterized by their urgency. This relates particularly to the COVID-19 pandemic due to its exponential growth potential without effective measures and climate change where time is lost each day without global consensus and respective action. Challenges call for new approaches regarding both top-down as well as bottom-up strategies. But the future is unclear, not only because predictive epidemiological modeling is difficult due to the complexities and uncertainties, but because it is by no means certain whether mankind will be able to manage the crises, particularly the largest of them, uh, climate change. In the last 20 years, the number of displaced persons worldwide has doubled with around 80 million in 2019, which approximates around 1% of the world population. Most of them are internally displaced, but many are, according to the definition of the United Nations, refugees and asylum seekers. Asylum first applications in Germany are shown here. We see the very large numbers in the year 2019, uh, 2016, uh, fo sorry, followed, following the massive immigration in the year before. After that, much fewer refugees uh, came to Germany and for the spring and summer of the year 2020, we can observe substantially lower rates. Uh, see the red line at the bottom of the graph. The distribution of countries of origin of these refugees coming to Germany has not changed. Most refugees come to Germany from Syria like before and other countries of the Near and Middle East and from the African continent. The observation of lower asylum application rates in the current year is clearly demonstrated in the comparison between the years 2019 on the left side and 2020 on the right side, where you see for the various months decreasing asylum application numbers in spring and early summer of this year. In blue, first and in green, follow applications are listed. Major reason for lower rates is the COVID-19 pandemic 
due to border closures and other reasons. The same observation is made regarding asylum applications in the European Union and as demonstrated in this graph with lower rates in 2020 and a striking dip in March, April and May and also in early summer of this year, which is due uh, again to the COVID-19 epidemic or pandemic. Here you see the deadliest infections in the world and their ranking. For COVID-19 numbers were extrapolated from the first four months of the epidemic, February till um, May 2020, and already reached the second rank after tuberculosis and before HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other infectious diseases. This graph from Clark and colleagues in The Lancet refers to the proportion of the population of the countries in the world at risk for severe outcome of COVID-19 infection, meaning not susceptibility to infection, but severe disease given infection. We can observe an interesting differences between the global north and the global south, but not in the way as we are used to with higher risks in the global south due to higher disease burdens, economical and infrastructural shortcomings in this region or climate change effects. No, regarding COVID-19, we observe an advantage of the global south as a consequence to demographic and epidemiological transitions and the syndemic of COVID-19 infection together with major non-communicable diseases such as cardiorespiratory diseases, cancer and others, the proportion of the population with a high risk of COVID-19 infection is much higher in the north in spite of overall better healthcare services. Of course, this does not mean that countries of the global south are not affected by severe outcomes of COVID-19. These countries are also substantially affected by COVID-19 and will definitely need adequate support regarding vaccine supply and other measures. As we will later hear from Charles Aguiemang in his talk, migrants and refugees represent a vulnerable most vulnerable population and are stronger affected by COVID-19 burden compared to the native population. As we know, health and disease burden of refugees can structurally be related to the phases of migration, where we distinguish a pre-departure phase from a travel and interception phase in the middle and a phase on the right if the migrant will reach his or her country of destination. All of these phases contain certain risk potentials. As you see, risky exposures can also happen in the host country due to an insecure legal status and the required adaptation to a new environment, which can represent mental stresses and may lead to deficiencies in access to healthcare and integration. Collective and mass accommodation and camps have among other infections promoted the spread of COVID-19. In addition, the COVID-19 epidemic in the host country may hinder language courses, thus leading to information deficits and destroy job opportunities. In addition, refoulement and forced returns are possible. So uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to uh, these introductory remarks. Um, I think we are just in time now exactly. So it's well fitted uh, to start uh, with our first uh, session. Miriam, if you Yes, uh, uh, with me. 
Yes, I'm with you. And thank you very much, Professor Kremer. Um, I would like to ask uh, Professor Urania Toraki to share her screen so we can start with the next presentation. Professor uh, Urania Toraki, welcome, uh, Urania. Um, we know each other uh, from various meetings, and I have also visited you in Lesbos uh, recently. Uh, last year. So welcome uh, to our conference. Thanks a lot for providing your presentation. Urania Zoraki is a professor from the University of the Aegean uh, from Lesbos, Greece. And of course, we'll talk about the situation in Lesbos to us. So the floor is yours, Urania. Welcome. No, vielen Dank, Professor Alexander. Ich bedanke mich sehr für die Einladung zum heutigen Symposium. Today, I'm going to present to you the situation in Lesbos related to the so-called refugee crisis. The main points of the presentation focus on the accommodation capacity uh, of the reception notification centers in Lesbos, how they have been created and uh, how they operate, health and environmental issues on the island related to a refugees' life, as well as the next step plans. In the last few years, Europe accepts the entry of thousands of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers in its geographical territories never experienced before. This migrant's pathway has followed two main routes, the central Mediterranean towards Italy and eastern Mediterranean towards Greece. Uh, from uh, 2014 up to date, the Eastern Mediterranean route registered about 1.2 million arrivals with a peak of 885,000 in 2015. The high numbers of immigrants from the Eastern Mediterranean route started to decrease in mid 2016, following the European Union statement with Turkey and the implementation of the action plan to secure the Turkish sea borders and accepted the return, return of irregular migrants uh, from European Union. As a result, the number of arrivals on the Greek islands decreased to 182,000 in 2016 and to 15,000 today in 2020, but mainly this year due to the strict COVID restrictions and the increase in the security in the sea borders. Considering arrivals by the sea, Lesbos, as you can see in the slide, was the island which registered always most of the arrivals, almost 60% of the total sea arrivals, followed by Samos and uh, Kos and Hios. Um, in responding to this uh, new challenge, the Greek government immediately um, started to operate six reception and identification centers on the islands of Lesbos, Hios, Samos, Leros, and Kos. These hot spots, as we commonly are, name them, um, accept people when they arrive, and very, very, very quickly they became overcrowded. And for that reason, the Greek government started to operate 30 temporary refugees camps from side to side across the country, hosting more than 30,000 refugees and migrants. Today, the refugees in Greece count in total 119,500, of which 99,600 live in mainland and 19,900 live on the islands of the, of the Eastern Aegean Islands, where also the University of the Aegean is located. Applications yet now of the Eastern Aegean Islands is subject to the application applica asylum application procedure, is subject to the Euro uh, European Union Turkey statement, and the total number of decisions in 2019 was 39,044 and uh, was pending at the end of 2019, 87,461 applications. So the refugee recognition rates reaches the 43,000, but still um, thousands of people 
are waiting in Greece for the final decision of their asylum. Since they were they waiting in Greece, the accommodation and social integration of such a high number of asylum seekers and refugees raise high concern. In Lesbos, since 2015, operate two um, reception and identification centers, the Moria and Karatepe RIC centers, research um, reception and identification center. Also operate the smaller camp PICPA and uh, uh, in several apartments in Mytilini town, um, they are used to host uh, this big number of uh, refugees. Here we can see a picture of uh, Karatepe Moria camp. It operates since 2015. Uh, it uh, can host uh, around 1,000 people and the living conditions are very good in this uh, small camp. Uh, here is a, a picture of big um, camp. This uh, camp um, actually it's very small and this uh, hosts only vulnerable people, unaccompanied minors or a pregnant women. And uh, also the conditions are very well. And we're moving to Moria. All of you, you know very well uh, the Moria camp. It was designed to host only 3,000 people, but from time to time host 8,000 people or 20,000 people this year. As, as you can see in this picture, it was uh, expanded with temporary tents in order to host these 1,000 people that uh, uh, were uh, released with uh, boats from um, due mainly to the Turkey policy. All these years, huge efforts uh, are said by the municipality of Mytilini, the Ministry of Migration and Asylum, the UNHCR, the locals, the NGOs, the volunteers, and also the local institutes such as the University of the Aegean, uh, the Iliaktida, the World Health Organization to serve the thousands of migrants arriving on the island. Many issues have to be solved, such as the identification and asylum procedure, that was it's always the priority, the accommodation, the shelters, food supply, hygiene items and clothes, health issues. And the next step is coming the education and integration of the refugees waiting in asylum demanding procedures. Many working groups operate every day and we are joining our efforts of uh, the efforts of public and private actors in the field such as the UNHCR, the NGOs, the ministry, the municipality. As you can see in the left part of this uh, slide, there are plenty working group that join the efforts in order to serve the thousands of migrants, like for instance, the basic assistant working group, the child protection working group, the health actors meeting, and all of these uh, people, they have uh, almost weekly meetings and they work every day very hard in order to improve the conditions. All these years, uh, all this effort and these joint actions, they have brought excellent results in many fields. But on the other hand, these actions, these joint trials cannot cover the extremely needs in the camps, unfortunately. Much worse is the experience and the conditions in Moria camp um, if compared to asylum seekers uh, experience with Karatepe and the other um, accommodation in the island. There are reports of overcrowding, lack of space, hunger, lack of hygiene, poor healthcare, insecurity and violence. Furthermore, food scarcity and the long waiting lines for food, as you can see here in the left pictures, refugees waiting on the line uh, to get their food. Then we see a girl carrying the daily food of uh, her family. Um, they create conflicts and aggressions among residents. Very often there is arguing between young migrants of different nationalities, cultural and religious background. However, these poor living conditions are not helping to the formation of a sense of community among asylum seekers and of potential social capital that can derive from that community. Concerning hygiene, there is a lack of conditions to fulfill, such as the basic 
uh, routines, such as insufficiency of drinking water and sanitation failures. The existing accommodation conditions do not protect from the cold and do not allow for the needed rest. Additionally, the dirtiness and the garbage built up destroy the surrounding environment and contribute to high risk for pandemic diseases in this size. My team has conducted an empirical analysis of the anthropogenic litter in two freshwater streams and other estuaries strongly affected by the mismanagement of anthropogenic litter in Moria refugee camp. You can see the pictures here. Here is the picture on the left of the stream crossing the Moria camp. And here is the estuaries. And also you can see two graphs, a graph that um, presents uh, uh, all this anthropogenic litter that collected uh, inside to one, meaning this side of the Moria stream and in the estuaries side two, four. As you can see, the bottles and plastic, pas, uh, bottles, plastic cutlery, artificial polymer items are found in higher percentage in Moria Camp River and its estuary. And uh, the Moria Camp and the Moria Camp operation in general increase the anthropogenic litter abundance in the stream 13 times more than the reference sites and she contributing in the tremendous deterioration of the fresh water quality and in the transport of huge anthropogenic litter volumes to the sea. However, several studies conducted in Lesbos showing the serious health issues found in asylum seekers. In physical terms, they report high levels of respiratory tract infections otorinolaryngology, musculoskeletal, and other diseases. The adverse experience of refugees, of violence, war separation of family members, or loss of family, and other traumatic life events. A study conducted by Mariam Sayestefar, that she is an Iranian uh, a refugee researcher that conducted research in the framework of uh, science for refugees in a GN archipelago um, project that was funded by the European Union um, investigated the mental health of female refugees inside the Moria camp. She used uh, um, some uh, questionnaires and interviews, uh, different um, methodological tools, and she asked 69 ladies they, uh, that they live in section C of Moria Cam. In this section, live only ladies that they are um, unaccompanied and uh, they are vulnerable. So they ask about uh, four important health related issues somatic symptoms, anxiety, and sleep disorder, and social disinfection, and severe depression. So the ladies answered answers the ladies are coming from Afghanistan, sub Sahara countries, Iran, and Somalia. So the majority of them answer that they cannot find a task to spread their time during the day and experience negative feelings of suicides. Despite the need for psychological care, there are only two psychologists in Moria who dedicate most of their time to vulnerability screenings, thus not having enough time to offer adequate psychological support. Consequently, among the main mental health issues found in this population are post-traumatic stress, symptom of uh, depression, anxiety, symptoms of fear, insecurity, feeling of sadness and hopelessness, and as well, nightmares and changes in sleep patterns. In addition to the uncertainty, to this uncertainty related to the outcome of the asylum application, asylum seekers have to deal with the, the uncertainty regarding the time they have to wait inside the camp. This is an unknown parameter. They face a daily struggle to preserve a sense of self and meaning for their life. In order to, uh, to face all these uh, problems, the University of the Aegean that is located in this island plays a very important role all this year. Uh, for instance, we have coordinated the Science for Refugees in Aegean Archipelago program. The chronicity of migrants in uh, flux boosts these actions uh, towards integration. So the Syria project for refugee sightings has helped more than 100 people who arrived in the Greek islands 
seeking asylum to improve their qualification as well as their life ch chances. Playing host to the project, we have brought changes also to the local university. The project aims to ease the integration of refugee sightings in the European research system and labor market by targeting support and training. Sightings from different places, they bring fresh ideas. They have the, the, the very good capacities. They can contribute in the European research area, but they, uh, they must have the opportunity to do that. And um, through our research, we have found out that 7% of the refugees that they are arriving, they have a, a university degree and 1% of them a master or a PhD. So we studied uh, through the project, uh, through research, the knowledge and the qualification of these people and uh, what they are missing. Uh, and we designed tailor-made seminar to cover their the needs. Uh, also, three of them, they got scholarships to conduct research in our university. And already I presented to you the research of uh, the refugee science, Mariam Sayestefa, uh, re related to the mental health of refugee women inside uh, the Moria Cup. Um, positive things we have, uh, you can visit the site of the project and you can have a, a, a more, a better idea about the tangible, tangible results of the program. We created webinars and we created the Syria book uh, to facilitate the um, uh, integration of refugee sites, especially in Greece and in Europe. And um, also, we have created a huge network for UNIS NGO. But most important of all is that the University of the Aegean today acts as point of contact for refugees, for Lesbos. We have opened our Greek language courses and we give uh, mentoring uh, to the refugee scientists that they are arriving on the island. At the same time, we, uh, we participate in the um, Bridge for Researchers in Danger going to Europe step two, that is coordinated by the University of uh, Bielefeld, and it's giving much uh, um, help to the refugee uh, scientists. And in the meantime, there is a shift in local's attitude from solidarity to negative attitudes, unfortunately. Here you can see the, in the right side, the picture of uh, old women in Scala Sikamyas village, where uh, they feed the baby of um, a refugee woman that just was rescued and arrived on the island. So people in 2015, the local population showed high solidarity. They provided assistance to the million, to these million of refugees which arrived on the island. And, but the chronicity of the problems in the refugee camps and the tremendous increase of their number have fit to extreme parties, like the Golden Dawn. At, as you can see here in the right part, we can see a scene of the Golden Dawn members to protest against uh, the camps and against the existence of uh, the refugees on the island. At the same time, refugees are protesting, asking for improvements of their daily life in the camps and, of course, the acceleration of asylum procedures. These difficult conditions, in combination with the strict measures due to COVID-19, created a dime bomb that finally exploded in September 2020. A fire had broken out after scuffs between migrants and Greek forces in the camp. Fires have destroyed the camp, leaving 13,000 of people without shelters. Then the army, with the help of the UNHCR and other organizations, here you can see the Moria camp today, and uh, what is uh, we have today. Started the creation of a temporary camp, this is the temporary camp, in the location of Mavrovuni or Karatepe. Today, life continues in this Mavrovuni camp under COVID-19 restrictions and strong security continuous works of drainage scalas, because you can see still we have very important problems in the new camp, the temporary camp, of course. Uh, drainage canals to protect from the flood, installation, installation of tap water, and other works are on the plan. Um, of course, important at this uh, period is that 7,000 of migrants were transported to other sites, so they left the island in the mainland, and discussions have yeah. started to find new locations to create a camp. 
on the island that the conditions will be better. You can see here a map that suggests the new location of uh, the new camp. It will be here a little bit on the center of the island in a forest area, very close to the municipality landfill. Still, there are a lot of strike about uh, and a lot of conflict about the location of the new uh, camp uh, because the municipalities, they have objections um, related to the location because there we have closed the location of archaeological sites, the risk of fires because it's located inside the forest, the risk of having 5,000 people of different religion and culture in the middle of the islands. So important is that 7,000 of people have moved away, but the most important um, is that there is a memorandum of understanding that was signed by the Minister of Migration and Asylum, uh, Mr. Notis Mitarakis, and the EU Commissioner for Internal Affairs, Mrs. Ilva, Mr. Ilva Johansson, regarding the construction of a model camp in the Lesbos. So we believe that the new camp is going to have better living conditions. But the European Union has closed its borders and um, prevent new arrivals or refugees. And while most countries gave up their promises to help by sharing the burden of the problem, only 1,066 refugees and migrants in Greece have moved from Greece. And nowadays, Greece hosts 120,000 people. And so, that means that only percent of refugees in Greece are relocated to other countries. So closing my presentation, I would like to um, help you for this uh, effort of uh, the Fluge uh, project that we have to join uh, our efforts because the needs of the refugee societies are very high and we have to work all together in order to solve these important problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Danke uh, schön. Thank you very much, uh, Rania, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Um, you uh, provided us with very important information and about the actual situation also in Lesbos. So this was great. Uh, you went a little bit about, uh, uh, you took a little bit longer than was uh, expected. But uh, I have to tell also the next speakers that you please uh, keep attention to your 15 minutes that we uh, also have a break and can relax a little bit or have our breakout session ready. And uh, the participants are again invited to uh, ask questions and provide comments in the chats. Miriam alluded uh, you to this, so please do so. Uh, and then we would like to continue now with our next presentation, uh, which is from Professor Ilke Sanje Yüksel uh, from uh, the Migration and Development Research Center of uh, Sukurova University in Adana, Turkey. Um, so Ilke, uh, very nice that you also agreed to participate in our conference and um, I would like to hand over to you. Again, uh, the participants will be able to ask questions and everything that we will later discuss. So Ilke, the floor is yours. Thanks again for coming to the conference. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Kramer. I hope my presentation is on the screen right now. Can you see that? Uh, yes, yes, we okay. do. Thank you. Um, dear colleagues and participants, I would like to start my talk uh, by thanking for inviting me to this respected conference and I salute you all with hope and solidarity in these uh, troubling times. Today in my talk, I will generally provide an up-to-date information related to the rights of refugees and asylum seekers in Turkey uh, and their conditions in terms of health issues specifically. Uh, um, um, please bear in mind, I'm a trained sociologist, uh, not a healthcare professional or um, uh, a health uh, professional. So I will try to look at the health issues more, more from a sociological perspective. Although uh, those who are more vulnerable, including uh, refugees and asylum seekers, have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic enormously, 
scope, scope of my talk is rather dealing with uh, health concerns in Turkey in general. Uh, pandemic specific talks will be given uh, by our esteemed colleagues in different geographical contexts during today's conf um, conference. Uh, Turkey continues to host the uh, largest number of refugees worldwide as the number of people forcibly displaced across the world due to Syrian revolution, conflict, violence and persecution hit uh, record levels since uh, 2011. Uh, Turkey has been a home for many migrants uh, and refugees and asylum seekers coming from different countries, mostly escaping from political conflict, persecution, poverty, and as Professor Kramer mentioned in his opening speech, uh, the irreversible consequences of uh, climate change. Uh, this map shows the countries and the major roads of refugees and asylum seekers arriving to Turkey, mostly with the hope uh, to move uh, forward. As you may see in the table, uh, in the last 30 years, the number of migrants in the country has risen from 1.1 million to almost 6 million, which makes 7% of total uh, population. And again, as you see, Refugees and asylum seekers are making uh, the 65% of total international migration, uh, total international migrant uh, community. Turkey currently hosts some 3.6 million registered Syrian refugees, along with close to 370,000 refugees, asylum seekers, and irregular migrants of other nationalities. Over 98% of Syrian refugees live across Turkey in 81 provinces in urban areas. Uh, about 1.5% of them are living in camps. Afghans, uh, Iraqis and Iranians are the major group, groups of asylum seekers after Syrian nationals. Turkey is a party to the 1951 Refugee Convention and uh, 1967 Protocol maintaining the geographical limitation to the 51 convention, thus retaining resettlement to a third country as the most preferred durable solution for refugees arrived due to uh, the events occurred outside of Europe. Turkey has been undertaking legislative and institutional reforms to build an effective national asylum system in compliance with the um, international standards. Um, uh, and we should, uh, uh, see this a bit uh, suspe uh, suspiciously. In April uh, 2013, Turkey's first ever asylum law, uh, the law on foreigners and international protection, uh, was entered into force on April 2014. The law uh, sets out uh, the main pillars of Turkey's national asylum system and established the Director General of Migration Management, uh, DGMM, as the main entity in charge of policymaking and proceeding for all foreigners in Turkey. Turkey also adopted temporary protection regulation in October 2014, which sets out the rights and obligations along with the procedures for those who are granted temporary protection in Turkey. In our case, uh, this is the Syrian nationals, as Turkey applies geographical limitation to 51 convention and only grants refugee status uh, to those who are from Europe. But I'd rather use the term refugee as an umbrella term, rather calling Syrians who are under temporary protection, which really does not make sense, is turned out, in fact, to be a permanent temporariness. International protection is applied in the form of conditional refugees for those who arrive in Turkey with asylum place and wait in the country until to be, res to be resettled into a sa safe third country like Afghanis, Iraqis or Iranians or, or those are coming from Bangladesh. Uh, since 2014, implementation of the law on foreigners and international protection permits access to protection, education and health care for migrants under international and or temporary protection on equal grants to Turkish students. This has resulted in improved access for migrants and refugees to education and to needed health services and medicines. Despite these positive developments, however, refugees continue to face challenges in securing the health and educational opportunities they need. I will try to explain why this is the case by looking at the city of Adana, where I live, uh, as an example. 
Uh, located in the middle of the Chukrova Plain, or historically called Kalikian Plain, Adana is the sixth largest city of Turkey with over 2.2 million uh, population nestled in the most fertile agricultural land of the whole country. In this slide, you can see the numbers of Syrians who live in Adana, uh, which is about 250,000. And the Syrian community makes up about 11% of the city's uh, population. Refugees and asylum seekers are mainly uh, Syrian, Afghan, and Iraqi nationals. Almost half of the Syri refugee population are under 18 years old, and schooling, is, uh, schooling rate is very low, especially at secondary so education level, which is a marker that most of these youngsters are in the labor market, mainly in the informal labor market. 70% of Yüreğir, the second largest district of the city, consists of agricultural land and uh, about 70,000 Syrians are living in the district, making the 80% of agricultural labor force. In labor market in Adana, refugees are establishing their own businesses in very small numbers, I should say. Some are working as independent craftsmen, though irregularly. But the majority of refugees are employees who do paid labor for others, mainly in the informal market. We observe a concentration in jobs that do not require qualification, high informality, uh, depending on social aids, very precarious conditions. Just to clarify, although temporary protection scheme provides access to labor markets since 2016, as of uh, 2020, only 37,000 Syrians were granted work permission in all around Turkey. But this means all others, I mean millions, depend on aids and informal precarious working conditions and live under extreme poverty. In my city, most of the refugees work in construction, uh, shoe manufacturing, textile sectors, and also in agricultural work. You may see in the picture those agriculture uh, workers uh, live in uh, plastic covered tents in the periphery of the city uh, in very poor working conditions for seven days, uh, 11 hours a day. And sadly, a high rate of child labor is one of the realities we face. As you may imagine, it is not possible to talk about even basics of hygiene in these conditions. Lack of water, soap, and even proper toilets are just ordinary cases we observe in the field. This uh, actually brings me to the issue of access to health services. Although I draw a rather depressing picture, I should say migrants' entitlements to health services in Turkey are slightly more inclusive, probably, probably the most inclusive right, uh, since the law includes uh, asylum seekers and persons with international protection application within the general health insurance coverage. All residents, regardless of status, now have access uh, well, uh, on paper, have access to emergency and primary health care services free of charge. Uh, in 2015, a new regulation, uh, a circular about conducting health services for foreigners under temporary protection, substituted the previous regulation by changing the conditions regarding access to secondary health services. Additionally, migrant patients now receive basic information and support to access health care services. According to MyPEX my 2020 data, uh, which is released only a week ago, Turkey scored 69 points, which reads as slightly favorable in terms of health services. You can see the, uh, you can see the uh, data uh, on the slide. Irregular migrants are recorded as stateless persons under the public health management system. While this possibility to benefit from healthcare services is a welcome improvement, there are, however, reported difficulties in patient monitoring. A major challenge, challenge in this regard uh, is the ongoing risk of possible notification of law inf enforcement authorities of irregular migrants and refugees registered in other provinces. The risk of deportation can therefore make migrants and refugees more reluctant to approach public hospitals. NGOs and professionals working in the field of migration have repeatedly raised the urgent need for measures that would help eliminate the risk. 
Uh, one good imp improvement is uh, 180 migrant health centers across 29 provinces are established since 2017 EU funding scheme, which employs Syrian health professionals. But apart from migrant health centers, refugees still complain of language barrier and discrimin discriminatory attitude they face, especially in public hospitals. There are case researches uh, and critical political research on refugee health, but unfortunately there aren't many comprehensive research on refugee health in Turkey based on empirical data. But it is worth to mention these three researches, uh, which were conducted in 2014, uh, 2015 and 2018 with relatively larger samples. Uh, a novel research has been conducted on the activities of migrant health centers to figure out the needs uh, for non-communicable non disease management in these uh, migrant health centers. Uh, the research is funded by German FW and conducted in cooperation between World Health Organization, a Ministry of Health uh, and Gazi University led by Professor Sechel Özkan. This is a relatively large research employing both quantitative and qualitative methodologies and conducted in nine cities with 1500 healthcare prof uh, personnel and patients, uh, including Syrian health professionals as well. Uh, to underline, especially uh, concerning non-communicable diseases, primary prevention measures need to recognize that different refugee and migrant populations will be distinct in terms of social, cultural and religious norms and the influence they have on modifiable non-communicable behaviors. Another problem is patients do not have a satisfactory levels of knowledge or awareness about NCDs or health lifestyle choices. Patients do not know which health services they can obtain at migrant health centers, according to the findings of these researchers. There are gaps in the treatment continuity of those refugees and asylum seekers affected by NCDs. Uh, as my colleague already mentioned, mental health problems should receive priority attention and mental health promotion and psychosocial support should be put in place. All stakeholders uh, should act together for improving health situation of refugees and asylum seekers by ensuring culturally competent uh, workforce. Uh, although there are improvements in health services, it seems that these are not enough. For a healthier community and society, we have to ensure securing better livelihoods uh, of refugees and asylum seekers. Unfortunately, discriminatory and unlawful, unlawful practices in education, health services, access to labor market, in daily life undermine the improvements and becomes real challenge. We need sound application of legislation. Uh, to be honest, for example, uh, irregular migrants from countries such as Afghanistan, Iraq and Iran cannot benefit from these practices and rights and are exposed to discrimination in this regard. Again, to be honest, speaking for Turkey, legislation without involving the parliament is a huge problem for both citizens and fellow migrants. Another challenge is, although there is a huge discourse of inclusionary policies, securitization of mig migration is on the rise. Most migrants fear stigmatization. Uh, welcoming attitudes seems to fade. Uh, 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 take, for example, EU's new pact on migration and asylum. It's increasing the securitization of border control and renationalization of asylum policies in Europe rather than Europeanization of them. Both EU and Turkey are using refugees as threats to each other. Turkey to be seen as a gatekeeper that caused many human rights violations in the country, at the border, and as my colleague already mentioned, uh, when they're crossing to Europe. And in terms of health-related issues, accessing services only in the cities where refugees are registered, risk of deportation for irregular migrants, lack of universal health coverage for all refugees and migrants, limited system of recognition of refugee skills in Turkey, especially for health professionals, seem major challenges. 
I should finish my talk by emphasizing that these fragmented policies and political crisis has been violating human dignity in many levels. We seem to have a long road ahead. And thank you very much for listening to me today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ilke uh, Yüksel, Professor Yüksel, for this very, very uh, good talk. So I'm very impressed uh, how you uh, presented the situation in Turkey and also related, although I understood that health is not your major subject of research, also to a very important health aspect. So thanks again. This was uh, great. Um, I would like to now um, announce uh, Professor Luciano Sasso, who is also here with us. Uh, Luciano plays an important role as a member of the M8 Alliance um, in the World Health Summit and has conducted uh, several conferences at his uh, home university at Sapienza University in Rome about uh, refugee and migrant uh, health. And he will uh, now talk to us about migrant and refugee health issues in Europe and address uh, the role of the universities. Um, Luciano, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. I would like to thank uh, very much Professor Kramer for the invitation. It is a great pleasure to, to be here. Uh, thank you also to the other colleagues in Billifield University, uh, Dr. Kerstin Smith uh, and uh, the excellent organ organizer, Miriam Simon, uh, who uh, provided us with so many important information in the last uh, few months. Uh, so I will try to be uh, brief. I know that uh, uh, we are a little bit late, so we'll try to keep the time. Uh, and going uh, quickly to some, uh, I'd like to start with some general concepts. Uh, first of all, we need to remember that you know migration is really, I would say, in the DNA of our species. As we all know, we escaped from Africa, uh, you know, maybe sixty or seventy thousand. Uh, years ago, and we distributed all over the planet, and maybe probably due to a climate change uh, at that time, and uh, without uh, this uh, kind of attitude to migrate, uh, the human species would have not been uh, uh, today here. So this is uh, just a general uh, con concept, but I think we need to keep it in mind. And also, let me mention uh, another general uh, element. Uh, today, I think the attitude to welcome migrants is completely different from uh, from the past. Uh, if we remember the Odyssey, and uh, Ulysses was uh, always uh, ended up, uh, you know, in uh, places uh, very often naked, without clothes, without sign of uh, his status. But he was uh, welcomed very often, you know, in a very warm uh, way. He was fed and uh, given clothes, etc. And then on the next day. They were asking him, you know, who are you? Where are you coming from? And and very often they were, you know, very surprised discovering, you know, that his status was very very uh, high. But you know, the hospitality was something very common, you know, in the many ancient civilizations. But I think today, even if we are richer, I think we lost uh, uh, much of it. And I like to quote again uh, Homer uh, saying that, you know, actually this. Uh, uh, migrants, the people coming to our countries, the foreigners are like gods that, you know, they, they visit our cities to check our equity. And you see, if it goes down. Okay, yes. And another element is also related to the pilg pilgrims. For many centuries, uh, people were uh, traveling in Europe, uh, you, you know, on, on foot. And uh, for many months, they were going uh, you know, across uh, different uh, countries and regions, etc. And, and again, the status of a, a pilgrim was a very respected, you know, pilgrims that were given uh, food and shelter and uh, treated uh, with a uh, high respect. And probably they, they were, uh, uh, you know, not so clean probably and uh, uh, very, very often hungry. So again, uh, a good example from history. And uh, more recently, also, if we look at the history of European Union, you know that the fathers of European Union, they actually uh, had the courage to sit at the same table after the terrible uh, Second World War. And uh, they established very early, you know, just a few years after the end of the war, you know, a very important uh, you know, agreement, which is called uh, the, the Coal and Steel uh, uh, Community in 1951. 
And uh, the idea, um, as uh, of course all of you know, started from one of the fathers of uh, European Union, Jean Monnet, and then uh, was voiced by Schumann, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of France in, um, in 1950, uh, you know, saying that, you know, to avoid another war, uh, the European countries uh, were invited to share, you know, the resources that at that time and also today are actually necessary to, to make weapons. So coal and steel were shared between European countries and mainly between France and Germany to avoid another war. And some countries like Italy, which of course they, they did not have any coal or any steel, they contributed with human resources. So there were at that time uh, uh, really a very significant uh, migration from the south towards the north, towards Germany, towards Belgium, of very poor people from the south, from Italy and other areas, you know, trying to again contribute uh, to uh, the, the again this uh, co new community and the treaty of, of rome in 1957 created uh, the european economic community which uh, later on uh, in uh, you know became the european uh, union and uh, i think many young italians today they completely forgot that actually this important treaty was actually signed in italy was signed in rome uh, and let's look very quickly to the map of uh, the European community in 1958. You know, if you see here, many countries, you know, which today belong to European Union, they are not even on, on this map. Of course, Germany, unfortunately, very sadly, was divided in two at that time. So let's, uh, again, remember, this uh, is not so long time ago. I mean, it's not only 1958, but the world uh, changed, uh, I mean, in this area of the world and improved uh, uh, so much. And uh, again, uh, in the, uh, after that, we managed to create uh, this agreement allowing people, Europeans, to go very freely from one country to another one without even showing an, a, a piece of ID. And uh, now again, this uh, Schengen agreement is under threat even for, uh, you know, for, for everyone. I, I traveled this summer and due to COVID, uh, I found again, uh, you know, long lines of, uh, you know, cars or people waiting to go from, from countries uh, that, you know, before they were completely, completely open. So again, let's remember what we achieved and then let's try to, uh, you know, value, value these achievements and not to lose them because in history, we very often, you know, many achievements, uh, you know, of uh, civilizations were lost afterwards. And uh, again, some uh, some numbers from the past. If we look at the migration from Italy to Belgium, you see that there is a peak in the late 70s, early 80s, of more than 250,000 Italians only migrating to Belgium. So these numbers, again, should be remembered today when we look, and I will do that in a few moments, and look at the numbers of migrants reaching European Union uh, today. Let's look at the numbers of Italians migrating to Argentina. It's more than 900,000 people migrating in the 1920s. We really invaded uh, Argentina. Buenos Aires uh, is, uh, became at a certain point an Italian city. And I think even the way they were speaking Spanish was really very much uh, Italianized. And nowadays, let's look at the number. The numbers are uh, based on the data from the UNHCR. We look at 79.5 million forcibly displaced people in the world, 26 million refugees. So these really numbers are really very, very high. And, uh, uh, you know, where are these people coming from? This uh, uh, slide is not uh, updated. This, uh, the data are related to 2015, but still I think it's very significant. Most of the people in uh, 2015, they were coming from Syria, Afghanistan, Somalia, South Sudan and Sudan. And they were going to countries and uh, here on the right, you see Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iran, etc. And you see there is no, not even one European Union country there. So basically, uh, you know, this uh, feeling that, uh, you know, before COVID, I would say it was very um, high, you know, in the news. Uh, after COVID, I think we don't talk anymore about these uh, aspects, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, many Europeans were kind of feeling that uh, there was an invasion going on. But again, data show that this is not, not true at all. Um, again, data from a few years ago, 2014, you see the main routes uh, of uh, migrants uh, coming to, to Europe. And uh, again, at that period, uh, uh, you know, in the news in Italy, very often we had, uh, you know, this feeling of invasion, 
of uh, you know Sicily and uh, especially Lampedusa, etc. They were you know in the news every day. People were feeling that you know these people were coming from Libya, but of course we know that they were not coming from Libya, but they were coming from other regions in the sub-Saharan region, and they were traveling for a very long time, very often for more than one year or two years. And uh, uh, this is linked to what I will say in a few moments. Also, you know, the, their uh, mental health, you know, very often was actually threatened by all the traumas they were receiving during these very long journeys. And um, on the other hand, the, the other route was involving Greece uh, through Turkey. It, it was mentioned already before by the other colleagues uh, before me, uh, with also very high numbers of migrants reaching, uh, reaching Greece. This is, uh, um, you know, uh, data uh, reported in a paper uh, in uh, Nature by uh, Abbott in 2016. And uh, you can see here, uh, you know, there was really, uh, the, the distribution was not even in European uh, um, Union. Uh, some countries like Germany or even Sweden, uh, if you look at the numbers of Sweden, are really impressive. Sweden is a small country in terms of population. And uh, they were really uh, very generous in welcoming uh, the people and, uh, you know, uh, trying to provide them, uh, you know, for uh, hospitality uh, there. And again, also in this map, uh, Italy, even if it is quite a large European Union country, had uh, much lower numbers uh, in this in this picture. Let me okay, put this down. And uh, um, again, uh, let, let's look at the trend. Uh, the peak was, uh, um, you know, for the migration to European Union around uh, uh, 2015. Again, with uh, peaks uh, per month of, uh, or, you know, more than 200,000 people. So quite a high uh, number of people. But again, uh, the European Union uh, um, at that time had about 500 million people. So in percentage, uh, the, these numbers are not extremely high. And then there was a, you know, a, a drastic uh, drop uh, after the agreement between the European Union and Turkey, having uh, numbers, especially to Italy, really very low. And Greece uh, became the country more exposed to migration, I would say, after 2000, uh, 2015. Let's look also at, the, unfortunately, the death of some of these migrants. You see the orange line. Uh, you know, gives uh, uh, the number of uh, people dying in the Mediterranean per month. And you see there is a peak of more than 1,000 people dying, you know, in 2000. Sorry, yes. uh, so, so you have to uh, proceed with the slides. We are still with the German, German ah. with this high number. So uh, just wanted to tell you, can you click? Uh, th thank you. Uh, uh, but uh, I see oh. on the screen, you don't, oh, okay, so, sorry. So let me, let me, let me share again, because uh, there's, there's a problem maybe with the sharing. Let me, let me share again. Do you see now? Yes, yes, now. Okay, so, sorry, there was a problem with the sharing. No so problem. I will, uh, I will go back then here. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, so this, this was the last one you saw, right? Yes, yes. Yes, okay, perfect. Okay, so this, sorry, so you missed this one. Uh, this was the one uh, related to, again, uh, the uh, European Union Turkey deal uh, with a drop of data and flows uh, after uh, 2016 to very, very low numbers for Italy compared to, to the past, and again, uh, Greece uh, in the front line. Uh, and then uh, this one was the one, uh, again, related uh, to the death of people in the Mediterranean. Again, more than 1,000 people who were dying in, uh, uh, in 2016 per month. So uh, again, uh, we have to be to compare, I mean, this strategy with uh, European values, because uh, again, I tried to show very briefly that European Union itself uh, really reached uh, a very um, uh, high level, I would say, of uh, uh, you know <clears throat> uh, values in terms of respect for uh, human life and other values. But uh, I think we have to, uh, at the same time, consider also the people who are trying to reach us, like you know, in the past. Many Europeans, many Italians were, uh, you know, emigrating somewhere else. Uh, so uh, I want to just quote very briefly this uh, publication in which uh, actually Italy was, uh, you know, quoted as a deadliest route to fortress Europe. So a little bit an exager exaggeration, but I think is useful to uh, to reflect on this on this concept. Uh, and again, uh, this dramatic drop of uh, migrants to. Uh, you know, to Italy, these are, you see, uh, just a few thousand people are reaching us uh, in 2019 and 2020. 
So um, I would say, uh, again, uh, compared to the number of people in need in the world, uh, uh, again, 79 million people, I think these numbers are too, too low. We should do more. Uh, again, uh, this is a little bit an exact exaggeration uh, in this uh, picture, but you know, to try to stimulate uh, thought uh, about this, uh, these issues. And recently, uh, you know, there was a new pact on migration and asylum. Uh, I think there are many good points in this pact, uh, but uh, uh, again, uh, in, in general, uh, the generosity of European Union, in my opinion, should be higher, like it was in 2015 by many countries. And but we know that politically speaking, then there was also a strong reaction, uh, you know, of the populism, you know, in many countries, which were very generous in 2015. Uh, so let's go to also to the impact in terms, as I mentioned, to uh, you know the mental health. Uh, there are some uh, really impressive data quoted in this paper by Abbott in 2016. If you look at Germany, for instance, uh, these are the percentages uh, of adults and children uh, who experience uh, traumatic uh, incidents. Look at. I was very much impressed uh, by the data that you see in the second line that, you know, you see about 60% of the refugees reaching Germany, I mean, in the 2015, saw dead bodies. I mean, this is something for me very, you know, impressive. I mean, uh, who uh, among us saw a dead body? I mean, 60% uh, of the people at that time were seeing, uh, you know, um, cadavers, which very often were members of the family or friends, etc. So this is a very traumatic experience, and we cannot expect, you know, the, the, these people to then integrate uh, so well after such traumatic experiences. And this is another data related to Sweden, again, another generous country at that time. So if you compare the Swedish-born non-refugee migrant and refugee migrant, there is a very significant uh, difference. And you can see here that, you know, in terms of incidence of schizophrenia and other non-affective psychotic disorders, the groups of the migrants and especially the refugee one is much higher the percentage, you know, the hazard ratio. So again, I think a very another very impressive data quoted in the, in this paper. So universities, of course, cannot solve completely these problems, but I think we can help a lot. Already, something was mentioned uh, by Rania also in the before me. Um, there was, uh, you know, there was a specific case of this uh, um, science for refugees uh, project mentioned by her, you know, providing research opportunities to some of these people, uh, trying to train uh, experts, you know, there are many uh, possible uh, training that the university could have put in place for medical professionals, for uh, intercultural mediators, for psychologists, etc., uh, providing education opportunities. Uh, facilitating uh, the recognition of the previous titles. This is a major issue discuss, discussed because many people come uh, with the previous uh, experience, you know, previous uh, titles, but not uh, always they can prove that, you know, the, uh, the, the, the type of title that they have. So universities, I think, should actually facilitate the recognition of, uh, of these titles, uh, provide uh, culture and sport offers, and I think also a very important role for universities is to provide advice to political authorities, because I think uh, very often they, they need a lot of this, uh, this advice. Uh, I want to mention also this map uh, that was created by the European uh, University Association. This is the largest asso association of uh, uh, universities in Europe. Uh, it has more than 800 members. And this is online. The slides will be available. Uh, so clicking on this link, you go to an interactive map and you can see one by one, you know, what different universities are doing in Europe and, you know, get ideas and see also what we uh, what we can do in this difficult field. Also, UNICA, this is uh, the association I chair at the moment and uh, is doing a lot. We organized recently also a webinar to discuss uh, some of these topics. And uh, I think, again, to keep uh, the debate uh, you know, uh, on in this moment is very important because, I mean, after uh, COVID, I think uh, the, the discussion, the debate on these topics has been really uh, very, very low. Um, as uh, Professor Kramer, uh, I, you know, mentioned, I represent my university, Sapienza, in the prestigious MH Alliance 
of academic health centers, university and national academies. Uh, we're organizing many activities uh, under the MH Alliance umbrella, and I want to announce you this series of webinars on refugee and migrant health, which will start in uh, January, end of January. And uh, some of the topics like, of course, COVID, first of all, the impact of COVID on migrants and refugees will be discussed in one of the webinars. The um, health uh, in the massive, you know, migrations, uh, uh, there is a type of migration areas in uh, Lebanon, uh, Iran, Turkey, Venezuela. I want to mention also one uh, uh, important point uh, in addition to digital health, mental health, which is the uh, improving healthcare systems in our countries. Uh, politically speaking, this is also very important to show that, you know, uh, organizing uh, better the, uh, you know, healthcare uh, facilities for migrants very often can improve the systems also for uh, people in our countries. And then again, uh, this can be a very important political argument against populism. Uh, there are also some publications which uh, came out of the M8 Alliance meetings that these are open access, completely uh, free online and can be downloaded from the M8 Alliance uh, website. Uh, and I thank you here very much for your attention. We are going uh, to move now into our discussion uh, section, and I think that uh, Dr. Kerstin Schmidt, who compiled uh, the questions and comments, uh, will now uh, say something shortly. Yeah, one, one thing from my side, um, it would be nice if all the speakers from the first slot could switch on their videos so we can see all of them. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> we cannot uh, open our videos. I think uh, you have to give us access. Mm -hmm. Just a second. So I don't have the uh, okay. chat function now, Miriam. Uh, so because I uh, already saw several questions. Um, yeah, I think Dr. Schmidt, she, she uh, okay. has all the questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I just uh, start. So far, we received um, uh, some question to um, individual speakers and a question to basically the the group of the speakers. So thanks a lot for this um, interesting for these interesting talks. Um, so there is a um, question um, for Professor um, Yuxel. Um, and the question is, uh, can I ask uh, how successful was the use of Syrian physicians into primary health care clinics in Turkey? Maybe you would like to say something to that question. Um, yeah, no, actually, um, at the beginning of the um, influx uh, until uh, 2016, even 2017, um, Syrian uh, professional health professionals were not be able to work in the uh, healthcare system uh, as uh, Turkish law uh, prohibits uh, uh, some um, uh, or recognize Turkish law legal system do not recognize uh, some skills of foreigners. And since Syrians were under the temporary, temporary protection scheme, which is uh, which still uh, un understand, it's not not understandable for me, uh, and unacceptable for me as well. Um, uh, so, but by by, uh, by uh, these after the circular passed in 2015 and uh, by the establishment of migrant health centers, Syrian professionals, uh, health professionals started to work, which actually uh, made the situation much, much, much better uh, because uh, most of the refugees and asylum seekers were uh, having uh, problems uh, related with language barrier, uh, according to our research, uh, during the health services, uh, during getting the health services. 
and also they uh, were claiming that they are uh, facing with uh, discriminatory attitudes of uh, Turkish uh, health professionals. So uh, Syrian uh, Syrians uh, working in the health services made a huge difference in terms of providing uh, better care uh, for uh, for refugees and asylum seekers. Although uh, I should say it uh, did not help uh, creating a, in, an inclusionary society. Uh, it just uh, caused uh, more exclusionary uh, practices, I believe. Okay, I, thank you so much for this uh, question and also for the answer. Uh, I see the chats now the, the questions here in front of me. So I would like to uh, take on the, the next question, is, which is from Adama Torli. And she uh, thanks uh, Professor Urania Zoraki. So it's a question for Urania. Uh, and uh, the question is, do we know the gender disaggregation of refugees in Lesbos? How many women uh, from the African region Nigeria, Somalia, and Eritrea were there. Urania, are you still with us? So this is a question for you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, they are asking about the numbers of the women and the African women. Women in... Uh, in yeah, the uh, proportion of women, actually. Uh, uh, um, I cannot say now the concrete number, but I can send it. But in general, the majority of the people there, so around 60, percent, 70 percent are men. So the minority is the women in the refugee camps. And from uh, Somalia and Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a very small portion, maybe five percent. But I, I have to check a little bit more precise the numbers. Yes, uh, thank you, Urania. And also thank you, uh, Adama, for asking the question. So we have uh, another uh, important question uh, for everybody, uh, for all the speakers, I guess. It's a more general question from Dr. Dilek Aslan uh, from uh, Hatzetepe University in Ankara in Turkey, asking uh, the following question. Could distinguished uh, speakers share their perspective on the highest priority of refugees uh, which the international community should unite? And what are the practical proposed recommendations to succeed? Uh, who would like to start uh, answering this question? So the highest priority of refugees with the international community, which should, uh, the, uh, should unite the international community, and what are the practical uh, the practi uh, practical proposed recommendations to succeed? Well, I think I can um, I can uh, yeah uh, comment on it. Um, I think that the um, certainly particularly in terms of in times of COVID, I think that you know uh, the the what I would say is that particularly the refugees and and and, and asylum seekers. Um, all these people should be given the opportunity. Actually, they should be um, there should be opportunities for all the countries to support, you know, to um, to refrain from even putting people in camps. Actually, at this particular moment in time, particularly um, given the, the the nature of of the COVID and how is it really affecting these people. And so, the countries um, should unite and support these populations and give them the necessary tools that they need, actually. And I think that is equally very important. Uh, what COVID has actually taught us for the last couple of months, that if the society as a whole, we don't um, address the health needs of the migrants, in the end, we pay a very, very heavy price, as I mentioned it in my talk, that just see what is happening, particularly in the US, that you know the minorities have been heavily affected. You are now paying billions uh, to put people on intensive care. Uh, so I think that you know the, this should serve as an example of how it is so important 
to, to address migrant health and treat migrants, uh, particularly the most vulnerable, as humans, not so as of you know, chucking them into camps and, and, and others. So I think the society should come forward and really see what you've done and probably uh, move forward and then ensure that you know, we learned our lessons and then, uh, yeah, move on. Because as uh, Professor you know, Sasso mentioned, migration is going to be with us it's just human and it's going to be so. It just happened that, you know, every, um, yeah, every generation have its own way of it. And it can, you know, flip from one continent to the other and one region to the other. So you should really, um, yeah, ensure that um, you treat it with care and, and then with humanity and then with humility and then with respect. Thank you. I can answer that as well, uh, if that's yes, okay. Um, thank you for the question to Dr. Assam. Um, there's a need for a good uh, widening governance, uh, actually, preferably from a bottom-up approach, as Charles already mentioned, um, uh, which en should engage, uh, I believe, preferably uh, refugees, refugee organizations, local actors. Uh, civil society and especially local authorities because centralized policies do not work, I can tell for Turkey. Uh, I mean, we have to uh, engage refugees themselves and we talk about them. This, this is our one of the major problem. Uh, one major challenge that the actors seem to be uh, more uh, reluctant to cooperate uh, especially when we think about the, this uh, lengthening process of um, uh, influx. And one issue that I uh, see also is a problem is the hypocrisy of mankind, humankind, I should say. COVID-19 has revealed the double-edged nature of irregular migrant workers uh, to the hosting so societies, for example. They simultaneously mean both risk and the opportunity. We can see it in Turkey. Work of irregular migrant workers are very fun functional in our uh, contemporary so uh, societies in the informal market, uh, you know, uh, do for the food chain because during COVID everybody needed food and you know all that stuff and the migrants uh, were out there, uh, the citizens out there doing the uh, jobs uh, which citizens weren't doing. Uh, this is, I think, the time to promote and to improve and recognize their uh, rights and statuses. This is what I would like to say. Okay, uh, may I continue maybe? Um, yes, please, Urania. Uh, so since we live in uh, the first service uh, centers, we live in the islands that we accept uh, the, this um, uh, irregular fluxes of um, refugees, um, we have different uh, needs. And uh, representing uh, the Aegean Islands and uh, institutes operating in this, I would um, say that uh, we need uh, uh, actually better living conditions in the camps. This is very important. And uh, we need, of course, um, uh, higher funding, and um, this is going to facilitate the better actions of the different actors in the field. And um, it will help much in improving the life of refugees. So refugees are waiting for their asylum application results. This is in, in, very important. When they get, they get asylum, they can continue their life. And the next step, so that we have two things, the asylum application that always is too long because we have all these irregular fluxes of people arriving on the islands and arriving in Europe in general. And secondly, very important is the integration of these people. This is very important. The integration can be achieved through education and through employment. So we need more funding in these two pillars, education of refugees and employment of refugees. Uh, it is, uh, in average, it is estimated that they need seven years to be, um, to start a normal life 
in a new country. Seven years, it's very long. It's a long time. We lose generations in that way. Uh, 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 refugees, they never continue their studies if they interact with them. Or uh, children, they have huge gaps in their education. So I think important, we have to work on these two important pillars, education and employment. Thank you. But there's a last, uh, thank you, uh, question, uh, again from uh, Adame Thorley, that goes uh, to Charles Agiemang, uh, referring to the vulnerability of uh, women, particularly regarding COVID-19, uh, with respect, for example, to limited sexual reproductive health services and uh, so far deficient activities uh, for women, uh, also regarding the pregnancies and so forth. Would you shortly like to answer, please, before we go on into the breakout sessions? Charles? Yeah, thank you very much um, again for uh, this interesting question. Certainly, I mean, the, the COVID-19 has uh, have, um, a huge uh, impact in, in many um, um, sectors. And we know that, you know, because of the COVID as well, um, certainly the issue of trust uh, is becoming a very very important many people are now don't even trust uh, the health system so people don't use it so again it's, it's not only reproductive but it's actually across all walks of you know different uh, conditions because also the the hospitals and others is also basically um you know uh, prioritizing uh, for the COVID, and that means that the basic services that were pro provided for these people have to also be um, changed so certainly there is a lot of um, uh, challenges now uh, including of course reproductive health of so women in, in particular uh, basically even if they do people don't want to move forward and people don't want to go forward again and then also what I'm also actually experiencing here, based on the work that we are doing, um, that you know, particularly people that have uh, non-documented people are increasingly getting uh, very desperate because many people tend to be able to work through their own, you know, networks, and that is. And now, because of the COVID, many people do not have this opportunity, and in some cases, people do not even have the basics to be able to again just a very simple you know being able to put a, you know food on, on a table so this is a huge lot of challenges and others so and that also means that you know the, the societies needs to put a system in place how do we ensure that particularly those non-documented people um, can have the basics that they need um, so what i would say is that you know there is a huge challenges and 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 the challenges that is imposing by COVID is, is really, really hitting uh, minorities very, very hard in terms of jobs, because of course, many of these people do jobs that are uh, essential and many of these essential jobs are, you know, many people losing their jobs because of, 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 of the situation. So yeah, I I what I would say is that, you know, the challenge is huge and, and, and we need to um, hold on into our authorities to do more to help these people, um, you know, across the board, including, you know, um, yeah, uh, women and, and then um, also reproductive um, services also needs to be improved. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And thank you all uh, other speakers as well. Uh, thank you also uh, those participants who uh, discussed with us. We are now moving into the experiment with a breakout session.